Well, welcome everyone to the response workshop as part of developing version two of the robotics roadmap for Australia. My name is Sue Kay and I'm the research director for cyber physical systems with CSIRO's data 61 and was involved in putting the first version of the roadmap together. So today, before we get into the uh, workshop, I would first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting today, the various lands on which we are all meeting today, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So this was the original roadmap that was released uh, in mid-2018, and it was a first attempt to look at what the capability in robotics was in Australia and to really define what the robotics industry in Australia looked like and the different ways that robotics would have an impact on every sector of the Australian economy. So we came up with a number of recommendations. I think there were 18 in total and we could broadly group those into five different categories of recommendations. Recommendations for industry, the education and research sectors, government, but also some recommendations around the culture that we would need in Australia to really promote the use of robotics more. And so you can see there that supporting an entrepreneurial culture around our niche capability and really harnessing the nation's imagination through aspirational challenges that help solve Australian challenges was recognised as an important area that robotics and the robotics industry really needs to address in this country, which leads us to this workshop. In the original roadmap, we didn't have a chapter around uh, response. And I think some of the feedback that we got and the reason that we're having this workshop today was that people really felt that we needed to have such a workshop. One of the great things about putting the original roadmap together was it really unearthed some of the fantastic story, success stories of robotics in Australia and some of the great influence that robotics has had in various parts of the economy and even uh, towards protecting the environment. And as part of that, we did a lot of mapping of the capability in Australia. So we are aware that there are some great companies here in Australia doing really interesting work across all parts of the continent. Um, I think the question probably on everyone's lips though is that if we have this great capability and we're doing some really interesting things, then you know we are obviously inhabiting a, 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 a continent that has a lot of challenges. We have a small population, a gigantic land mass, and we are faced with very extreme environmental uh, conditions and climatic conditions at times. We're a la land of droughts and uh, droughts and floods. And I guess when we see images like this and experience these events in Australia, floods, fires, the most recent uh, pandemic crisis that we are going through. The question on many people's lips, particularly for people in the robotics community, is well, where are the robots? Um, we've been developing some great technology. When is it going to be time that we can apply robotics to help us to address these major challenges that we are facing? And that's the purpose of today's workshop. And there is some great examples. This is a local company in Brisbane called BIA5 who have developed a firefighting robot that you can see being tested out here at the moment. It seems that a lot of the components that we need to uh, deploy robots to help us when we're facing these grand challenges are almost there. What is it? What are the next steps that are going to help us take it that bit further so that the next time we have a major challenge in Australia, you will see robots like this on the front line being deployed to good effect. And we have some, another, you know, we have some great capability. So from CSIRO's Data 61, uh, uh, we have a team that has been competing in the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, which involves putting teams of robots together to explore an underground environment. And you can imagine this would be a great scenario in a search and rescue situation where you have an unknown situation underground. You don't want to send people into a potentially hazardous situation. So you really need to be able to send robots down. And that's the challenge that this is addressing. 
So in the last challenge, we sent down one of BIA5's robots. You can see there the orange robot uh, carrying a drone from another local company, Emerson,t uh, equipped with CSIRO Data61 technology. Uh, and here is the robot just about to uh, move into the underground environment. You can see the robot is carrying the drone. Uh, it is actually mapping as it's going along in the environment. In a moment, you'll see the drone actually launching from the back of the robot and helping to explore because this is a three-dimensional space uh, with actually quite a lot of vertical areas that can't be explored by a ground robot alone. So there goes the drone out exploring the environment. And from that, we've been able to develop some fantastic uh, uh, mapping technologies that really can take you into that environment. And you can see the robots autonomously collecting this information, actually sharing all of this information with the other robots on the course and being used to identify particular artifacts. So gaining situational awareness uh, in, an, in the event that you might need to send people down into that environment. So the, I'm trying to paint a picture that we've got a lot of the key ingredients. What do we need to do to bring them together to solve a lot of the challenges that we might face in the future? The second version of the robotics roadmap is, is being put together so that we can keep some of the momentum going from the first roadmap, which helped to raise awareness of a lot of the robotics work happening in Australia today. It's also to help encourage the development of the right skills that we need to support the industry, to identify where Australia can make a difference. And I believe that there are a number of areas where we can do that, to help unearth capability. So we feel that in the first roadmap, we're really only scratching the surface of some of the amazing companies that are out there doing great work in robotics in this country. And ultimately, we want to establish a clearly recognised robotics industry in Australia. And as we've had to move all of these workshops online, we're sensitive that you might not necessarily get as much opportunity to contribute to the roadmap as you would like. And so we have set up a survey that you can see the link to there um, on the screen that we would encourage you to fill out so that you can provide content that, that you think is relevant for the roadmap. I'll also post that into the webcast for you to view. So today I'm going to be handing over in a minute to Elliot Duff from CSIRO's Data61 to talk, talk about bushfire response. And then we'll be hearing from David Kavanagh, Ian Manchester, and then we're going to move into a more interactive session where you'll have the opportunity to contribute some of your ideas through an online um, process using a mirror board. So you'll be given some instructions on that. Don't be too worried, it's fairly intuitive. So uh, I'd like to thank my co-chairs for this session, Ian Manchester, Elliot Duff, Catherine Forchina, Mary McGeeck and David Kavanagh for putting this uh, workshop together today. And I will now hand over to Elliot Duff to talk about the bushfire response. Thank you. Right, uh, thanks Sue. Um, right, okay, I'll um, share my presentation here. So good morning to everyone. Um, so the is a bit confused, but the word response robotics is sort of a new term that's coming around. A lot of people used to call it rescue robots. So you'll see these words used interchangeable, interchangeably, but it's a little bit dangerous. So I'll, I'll explain why that's important. Um, but what I'm looking at is, is the situation here in Australia, what capabilities we have, and looking at some of the challenges that we have in Australia around uh, the bushfire use case. So um, over the last couple of years, there's been a, a significant amount of activity in this space in terms of reports. So out of the UK, there's the UK Robotics and Autonomous Systems uh, Network, who have written a report on extreme environmental robotics and uh, robotics for emergency response. NIST, which is the American National Institute for Standards and Technology, have, um, have websites on this. They also have testing regimes. And the Japanese are very interested in rescue robots for particular earthquakes and other situations. So these are sort of some of the materials that you could use to understand what the state of the art is. Websites on this testing regimes, and the Japanese are. I'm getting an echo here. I'll just stop that. Situations. So these are sort of some of the materials that you could use to understand. Check that down. Sorry.
So this is the some of the um, uh, robots that we have in Australia. So Sue was mentioning BIA5 and Emerson with the hover map, but we have Australian Droid and Robot, the Little Ripper that deploys um, um, rescue for uh, surfers. There's Emily, which is a sort of a, a once in a, another ocean rescue. Uh, Nexus uh, Magneto, which is confined space, Bolton Labs and Swerp. I'm sure there are probably some other hidden gems out there, but that's probably one of the challenges that we face in Australia around finding the companies that can do this type of work. Uh, to also assist here, there's a number of robotic challenges. Um, the one most relevant here was a couple of about 2015, uh, the DARPA Robotics Challenge, which was designed to effectively solve a sort of Fukushima type um, disaster where robots go in and turn valves and, and climb stairs and, and open doors and so forth. Um, that turned out not to be that successful, but it does lead to, has led to some new technologies that would, would probably be a lot more suitable. The Europeans have a European Robotics League in the emergency robots that was done back in 2017. And Sue uh, was talking about the DARPA subterranean challenge. And so this is the situation of going in and looking for people and other assets in underground uh, environments or GPS denied environments, either buildings or caves. I won't show you the video because Sue showed you some of the video there. I won't go through all of it. So what sort of robots, uh, rescue robots do we have in the media? So. About 10 years ago, there was a robot deployed, an Australian robot deployed out to a New Zealand mine. Uh, that didn't work. Um, it, it didn't, it broke down in the in some water and these, there, was, there were some trap miners and it, the robot didn't work. 2020, 10 years on, um, a robot was deployed, a drone was deployed to investigate um, the situation in a mine down in Tasmania. Unfortunately, the people had perished but the robot did mean, mean that people didn't have to expose themselves to that uh, danger. So the re this is sort of explaining why the language around the robotics or the response robotics ecosystem. And so let's look at bushfires in particular. So let's look at a scenario of a spot bushfire and, and how robots could address this. So what we're looking at is this is happening during the event and if we look at the scale of the event and the number of robots that we need to deploy, we're looking at a region of about 100 metres and we're looking at, at one to 10 robots. And what we define this is rescue or relief robotics. So the, the robot is there to either rescue the person or to monitor what's going on or, or monitor the situation. And the response at the top here is, is rapid. It needs to be rapid and it's ephemeral, in other words, it goes in, does its job, and then it's decommit It's finished the job. And then we look at scaling up. So we're looking at, say, localised bushfires, you know, regional bushfire around the kilometre, where we're looking at, say, 10 to 100 robots. And then we're, and then we're looking at national, sort of statewide bushfires, where we're looking at hundreds of kilometres being impacted and potentially 100 to 10,000 robots being used. This is sort of scenarios. So we're looking at this vertical in, in, in terms of what's happening during the event. And the challenge that we face here is that these robots have to be in storage, ready for being deployed at a moment's notice, and then they often doing their work and then they have to come back. And this has been found to not be a very practical solution. So what we can look at is the role of robotics before the event. So we're looking at the time horizon here. So before the event, what we can have is robots that monitor and manage the ecosystem, such as fuel load. Uh, so these robots are long-term persistent response to the event, so they're preventative. And then after the event is around rehabilitation. And in this situation, we have dynamic persistent response. So before the event, uh, we can understand what the robot needs to do. Um, so it's sort of long-term planning. We, we understand what's going on. After the event, the robots have to deal with a dynamic changing environment because the, the environment has changed because of the disaster. So I think this is how we should be thinking about, in rather than we're using the word rescue, because that just de defines that, that middle column, we need to look at the whole response as before, during and after 
the event. And they may or may not be the same robots, but that's how we should be thinking about this scenario. And of course, we can change the event here. So in this case, the event is a bushfire, which is the topic of this, this presentation. But that could be a cyclone or an earthquake or a flood, and in which case the robots are monitoring and managing the built infrastructure rather than the forest. And after the event, they're actually rebuilding or de demolishing the buildings safely. So this is how we're thinking about it. So this changes the requirements for, the, for robots. So traditional 3Ds of robots have been dull, dirty, and dangerous. But now for response robots, we need three extra Ds, which is demanding, distant, and distributed. And distributed is probably the most important here. It allows for an agile and scalable deployment of robots. And the requirements of that is that it has to operate in unstructured dynamic environments without supporting infrastructure because the infrastructure may be destroyed in the, in the disaster. And the robots need to be reconfigurable, redeployable, resilient or redundant. So these are new characteristics, are unique characteristics to response robotics. So this requires a, a change of thinking. And uh, just a recently, the Bushfire Royal Commission allowed drones to be used for, for bushfires. And this is what was presented in the ABC News of an emergency responder controlling a drone. And the, so where the robot is just a remotely controlled machine. And this is wrong thinking uh, because what we really want to do is have a person safely in a remote control center um, controlling that drone. And we want an autonomous pilot is actually flying that drone. Okay, and so where the, in this future scenario, the autonomous pilot could be anywhere. It could be in the drone, it could be in the control or somewhere else. And this is where we need to start thinking about the, the, the way that we think about robots as not something that we control with a remote control, but they control themselves and we act in the mission control situation. So here's a scenario that we're looking at currently, very similar to the uh, DARPA challenge scenario, but instead of exploring caves where, or underground environments, we're exploring a canopy, a forest. And so we have a robot on the ground, a drone, we have uh, infrastructure, and we have a mission control system. And what we're looking at here is this technology has multiple dual use. So it can monitor and manage the ecosystem by improving the resilience and the rehabilitation, looking at fuel load and biodiversity assessment of the forest. And this is sort of an example of that um, technology being used by one of our partners. So Hovermap, Emerson, Hovermap. So this, this drone here is flying autonomously through a forest. It's avoiding all the trees, it's path planning, it's doing its, its, its thing. And this is the type of map that you get out of that technology. So you can see that this it is going to give you sufficient information to understand both the, the fuel loads that, may, uh, that are present, but also to perhaps in future, we're looking at uh, managing the biodiversity of this environment. Okay, so there we go. And so I think I'm running out of time. So the conclusion is here that the lessons learned, there's an interesting um, report from the conversation around uh, emergency robots in around COVID. And that is that we, that robots should be helping work, workers or the emergency responders not replacing them. So it's a, it's a collaborative system. And that off the sh we need to use off the shelf um, systems rather than things that are being custom built and then put in a cupboard. So the stockpiling, it just doesn't work. That's what happened in Fukushima. They had robots to, to work, but when they, when the disaster happened and they turned them on, you know, you have flat batteries, people don't know how to operate them. You get code rot. Um, there's all these scenarios where these robots aren't ready to be used and the reality, of course, is you can't build a robot for every event. So we can sort of think of all the disasters that can happen. We can't build a robot for every one of those disasters. We have to think differently about this. And also we need to create a community of capability. And that's the importance of having different cap human capability as well as robotics. So this is around, this is the motivation for the Australian Robotics Network, which is the host for the robotics roadmap. So uh, re reiterating, robots need to be redeployable, reconfigurable, resilient, and redundant. And the example of that I've got over on the right-hand side there is a robot that was built called Numbat at QCAT 
back in 1990. So this is an emergency responder robot to go into a mine that, with explosion proof that was pressurized with nitrogen, had 30 kilometers of optical fiber. It was Once it was built, it was then decommissioned because no one was willing to fund it to keep it in reserve for an emergency. So the economics of this just doesn't make sense. We need to change the paradigm. And I think What's really important at the end, the conclusion here is that people need to understand that robots can actually do things differently to how humans do it. So we need to think outside the box in, in the way that they respond to an emergency. And, and an interesting idea is that can vo robots volunteer for service? In other words, we have currently a volunteer firefighting service. Can we have a robotic volunteering fire service? Because in the future, you know, 10, 20 years into the future, we're going to have autonomous cars on the road. We're going to have autonomous vehicles on in, in farms, you know, agriculture, mining. Can any of those machines be redeployed and act as emergency firefighters? Um, and that leads to our later discussion. I'll leave that to discussions later on. So I'm finished now. So I'm going to hand over to David, who's going to talk about um, COVID. So. Thanks very much, uh, Elliot, and uh, a, a very nice segue indeed. Uh, I'll just uh, share my screen here. So I'm speaking to I'm speaking to a pandemic as the case study for uh, case study for robotics, uh, autonomous and intelligent systems. Covering uh, COVID as the live example, uh, the stages and key activities, what are the needs and opportunities for robotics automation intelligence systems? How does that play into the smart medicine of our future? And also link a little bit into the opportunity for Australia to develop and export our services and capabilities and share a little on what we've learned. So my background is um, medicine and engineering, practical experience as a medic and in emergency services in energy uh, companies and then around the world, uh, about 20 countries so far helping teams uh, work better, including in risk and HSC. And most recently, uh, corona, coronavirus uh, support, both at uh, local government, uh, state and national level, and uh, small businesses also. So uh, we've also uh, provided a course in this uh, and we provide advice to uh, chief scientists and health authorities uh, here in WA, and we work to contribute to knowledge sharing uh, globally also. So I'll just introduce this in the words of the World Health Organization back on March the 11th. In the past few weeks, the number of cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased certain form. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. So a key nature of the pandemic, the coronavirus, was its very rapid spread from China across Iran, Italy, and hence uh, around the rest of the world. In the weeks and weeks ahead, we expect to see the number of cases, the number of deaths, and the number of affected countries climb even higher. So a key factor of this stage was the very large number of unknowns. We knew it was rapidly spreading from person to person but many characteristics of the infection were yet to be determined. So this has since grown to create uh, the biggest challenge we've seen globally since World War II, in the words of the UN Secretary General, humankind at stake. And one of the particular challenges is it requires coordinated response at a national, state and local level. And uh, this leads into the opportunity for uh, automation and intelligence systems also. When we look at the situation globally, uh, it's continued to worsen. Uh, the total case count is accelerating, not abating, uh, unlike in Australia. And likewise, the total death count continues to climb dramatically. Uh, even in first world countries like the US and Sweden, we see the projections as of yesterday, the projected count is now exceeding 200,000. And you can see to the right-hand side of the graphic continues to accelerate. 
And when healthcare facilities are overwhelmed, as in Italy, uh, that leads to uh, improvised, uh, improvised facilities, very high uh, morbidity and ultimately uh, mortality, which includes amongst healthcare workers who are uh, at high risk. When we look at the sequence of events in, uh, across the world and in Australia, you see in this plot we have the international responses in purple, the Australian responses in blue, in, sorry, in black, the state responses in blue, and the local government responses in green. Uh, from the period from the 17th of March, it was an, uh, a period of very rapid change. And when I ran that city workshop uh, just a few days later, uh, the projections were quite severe in terms of what could happen in our communities. But even at that time, I was able to use modelling to help show what would happen, what we expected to happen, and the effect that we could have by making the right choices uh, and influencing the right behaviours. And in this case, as you've seen, this is Western Australia, but Australia is similar. We're able to diverge to the right away from the predicted curve uh, and rapidly achieve, in fact, zero cases. Uh, in WA and elimination from the healthcare system here. And when we look at a global response uh, comparison, Australia uh, was one of the best responders in the world. Uh, even some countries which started well, like Singapore, have uh, suffered increased cases. Um, and South America, as well as the US, uh, are real focus at the moment. And even countries like New Zealand, which had declared themselves free, uh, only within the last couple of days now have cases back in the country uh, and we've seen resurgence in China also. So this is a, a strong challenge both to our healthcare system uh, and to our economic uh, livelihoods. And a key factor in responding well is the accelerated innovation which is taking place in Australia and around the world and remains a big opportunity uh, for the future. So by responding to enable uh, all in the community to be able to restrain the, or constrain their movements, we've seen a great, great success relative to the rest of the world. And we can see this both in health and economic terms. So this uh, matrix of uh, health outcomes against uh, economic outcomes, it looks like Australia has effectively controlled the virus and is responding rapidly, whereas other parts of the world are more in the middle of the, of the plot here. Uh, so when I was, two weeks after I gave that first workshop, I was able to say, when I stood there, we had 30,000 lives at risk in the state. And when I applied that to the community, the 100,000 people, uh, more than 1,000 lives at risk. Uh, with projections showing it would be overrun within a couple of weeks. Uh, but strong aligned action on that day by that community, uh, by our state and by our nation, have seen us respond uh, very well. Uh, so it, we're now more like in a positive breakthrough rather than a constrained case or a case of being overrun. And this actually builds the uh, appetite for innovation and engaging in this workshop today. So thank you to anyone from the City of Melbourne on the call today. Uh, and the key underpinning this was, well, what have we learned as we're progressing and what can we share? And by using the uh, mathematical models that represent the network, we're able to uh, understand that clearly. We're also able to, uh, to uh, systematically identify uh, good practice measures and enable uh, Australian communities and others to see where they are placed uh, in being prepared for the worst case scenario, for example, which is where one class of robots have a key role and uh, where they're also in planning for return to normal, where robotics and automation can help us in both of those cases. We've supported that with planning and education, which is a key one. And this explains a little bit of the maths behind it as we go from a susceptible population to an exposed population to an infected or recovered population. By understanding the nature of the maths and the possibility for super spreader events, we're able to, uh, we're able to develop the right measures to respond, which enable both lives and livelihoods to be saved. And you can see this in terms of the graphical burst out. And as Ian will explain later, the maths underlying it are quite similar between bushfires and pandemics. And we can build that into the right environment, just as Elliot showed the drone being flown. 
from the operations center. We practically use uh, an operations center like that for understanding uh, what the new information is telling us, uh, looking forward, informed by the model, uh, making the right adjustments to the model uh, to respond accordingly. So we use this uh, we use this routinely, and we use it in a digital virtual environment. So we can have people up to 20 people from anywhere in the world in that place at the same time. So if we're supporting South America or regional outback Western Australia, we can very quickly deploy these types of measures. So what have we what have we learned? Uh, certainly that uh, informed, localized, near real time epidemiological modeling. Uh, to evaluate options, predict outcomes, communicate and influence behaviour has been really effective, uh, even at the community level with a very quick turnaround. Things that would have taken months before we were doing within, uh, we were doing within actually uh, three days. Uh, and I was using that live in the workshop. Uh, and a key factor, of course, is culture and motivation, how to engage people and make this localised and personalised. And I think extending robotics in that way holds great future too. Uh, we've been sharing this work, of course. Uh, this is a presentation of a series of epidemiologists. And on the left-hand side, you can see what was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal uh, quoting this work. And making it practical in application. So in the plot here, we've shown the green arrow down is the reduction in infection, which is possible by the intelligent sensing uh, of, for example, a mobile app and there is great opportunity to extend beyond what we currently have to give us an effective digital collective immunity in the absence of uh, a vaccine. But this plays as, as Elliot nicely introduced, how, are you, how should you be ready? How should you be investigating and recognising these things early and then being prepared to uh, initiate, accelerate, uh, to respond and then to recover? And the terminology is different here, and we find that data is different across different areas as well, so opportunity there. So some key questions, many of which still remain. What's the nature of the virus? What's the severity of the disease? How is it transmitted? What's the burden on public health? And how do we inform, engage and empower the public? And the latter point, particularly important until there's a in the very early stages of treatment or, or vaccination. And there's significant opportunity for sensing systems here. And Elliot's shown some good examples, other types of environmental sensing, uh, biological sensing too. Pardon me. And an important thing we learned, of course, was the need for local availability of PPE and the sustained capacity for agile manufacturing to support us. And then we are yet to be, uh, we're still to arrange a vaccination once that's available but there's significant opportunity through automation and intelligent application systems to accelerate that too, as there is for the research. Um, sorry. So uh, big opportunities also when we look at in high clinical severity, significant exposure, uh, more than 200 deaths in the healthcare system in the UK, for example, and we see strong opportunity for that to be reduced, that exposure to be reduced by 85% or more through some uh, technologically supported systems of uh, uh, augmented reality and uh, robotics. So many questions still remain. And uh, the, the more effectively we can harness the, the digital firepower to uh, gather this information and analyze it, the more quickly we'll have an enduring solution. So uh, a key to success has been working together collaboratively around a plan. Uh, which exists both at the national level and state level, uh, still opportunities to improve, but that's definitely been a key factor and the importance of monitoring for a second wave of the outbreak uh, or development of resistance and effective communication. So plenty of monitoring, again, a call for systems. So if we look forward into this, uh, now we're starting to see uh, a, rapid, a rapid level of increase in interest in how robots can play into this uh, ecosystem of health. Um, On-body sensors offer a strong opportunity. Hundreds of thousands of people have uh, smartphones or smartwatches or Fitbits, which in fact would inform quite a lot about their health and give some early warning. Uh, and the right combination of robotics uh, to reduce the risk and enhance the productivity 
working alongside the healthcare workers uh, and the emergency responders. And I look forward to hearing from all of you the cases that you see. It certainly evolves from the uh, understanding we have globally in aspects like smart city, with smart health, smart education, uh, public safety, smart home, and an internet of things, all the items I've shown here in green, uh, key both for smart city use generally, but particularly in the case of the pandemic response. Uh, and here I've shown a few cases uh, which uh, come to mind. The top left, Australian Innovation uh, from Eric Peck and his team, where uh, critical medical supplies are deployed uh, in a range of uh, environments around the world. In Australia, these could be used potentially for accelerating delivery of testing from country areas to uh, labs for analysis. Um, State-of-the-art telemedicine, and I've shown here some use cases where uh, the folks that are wearing uh, augmented, re augmented reality glasses, which enables significant reduction of exposure uh, in, uh, to the, to the uh, possible infection from the patient in the order of 80% plus uh, potentially, and extending their capability over distance. In the top right, we've got some robots which are being used for disinfecting. Uh, and, uh, and, and on the lower right, we see one of the locally deployed robots here in uh, WA, uh, a cobot used in the hospital to move things around and people are getting used to that uh, now. So I see there's very significant opportunity here. Um, one of our colleagues at Integrated Energy on the AI side is using uh, graphical means to help train an AI system for uh, identification of uh, the COVID virus amongst many thousands of other uh, cases on, uh, online. And when we look at the needs for response and recovery, uh, very distinctively, a very high number of uh, players at the local, state and national level. And um, these are, uh, and as we've seen, unfortunately, on several occasions, maintaining the situational awareness across all of those uh, is a challenge. Um, and definitely there's opportunity there, I believe, uh, to enhance that from our work in other industries. I'll show you a little bit here of the, uh, the, the environment that we use uh, regularly for bringing this information together and making decisions. And this is the type of environment that Elliot was talking about, where if you are flying a, a drone uh, or deploying a robot, uh, this is the situational awareness and this is where the algorithms are being developed that would shape the deployment of those sorts of measures. So in here, we bring together um, all of the contextual information that's needed, both at uh, global, national and state level, and then bring it down to the specifics of the people responsible for one particular city, for example, or taking this information and turning it into the next evolution of the model, which then uh, enables the right decisions to be made. The other aspect is we're able to digitally join environments you can't join physically. So we just stepped across into a hospital where clinicians are supporting uh, infectious patients or researching new aspects of treatment, which we can't physically co-locate, but we're able, to, uh, we're able to digitally bring them together. And the person at the back here might be the one who's flying the drone or deploying the robot or enhancing the algorithm or uh, or indeed uh, developing the next iteration of the model. So that's an example of how that we're using uh, today. So we've seen significant acceleration of innovation and uh, plenty more to come. High speed testing, uh, new integrated operations models, uh, new 3D printing and rapid development of treatments were the first to just coming through and use of CCTV, drones for surveillance, broadcasting and other measures. And the ability to track and trace effectively uh, and use localised data is a big opportunity which aligns with Australia's strengths. Uh, we've seen strong success in places like Taiwan, where they do have good integrated systems to support them. And uh, we've seen uh, accelerated national and state responses. 20 years of progress in two weeks was a case in point for industrial relations and some of the underpinners, underpinning features we need for innovation. Uh, so as we look forward, uh, our some of our current work is with uh, South America, with CSIRO and with Austrade uh, together with ourselves. 
Uh, we're a part of a group of Australian companies who are uh, ex looking to export services and capabilities me, to South America, where there's currently the biggest need. And uh, I'm really pleased that we've been able to build this type of collaboration uh, to support the global need. So uh, conclusions from me, we've certainly achieved uh, strong results across Australia and uh, progressive measures at local, state and federal measure have been a key to that. Uh, modelling, mathematical understanding of the nature of the disease uh, has certainly been a key for enabling the right choices and the right learning. Um, and by extension, we can also plan what should you be ready for and what should your playbook be for response uh, as we go forward. Uh, there's significant learning which we can share to other parts of the world, I believe. Um, and our experience of the likes of the Ruby Princess and Tasmanian hospitals and others show the value of digital systems for pandemic response for contact tracing, situational awareness, uh, in, for example, through an integrated operations model. I believe this enables tremendous opportunity at a time of global need for Australian knowledge in robotics, automation and in intelligent systems in an integrated and remote operations model, which we can develop and deploy for COVID-19 and future pandemics. And certainly the collaboration enabled by the pandemic is a key for success. So I look forward to your uh, input to the next stages. And thank you very much. So now uh, handing over to Ian. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, now, I believe I've just shared my screen, so hopefully everybody can see that. Okay, so um, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for your attention. Um, my name is Ian Manchester. For those who don't know me, I'm co-director of the Sydney Institute for Robotics and Intelligent Systems and director of research at the Australian Centre for Field Robotics at the University of Sydney. So um, what I'm going to be doing is just trying to pull together a couple of these seemingly very disparate topics of bushfires and epidemics such as COVID. And this is through the concept of spreading processes. So it turns out that there is there are some very kind of prominent high level analogies between the two as, as David uh, um, mentioned a few minutes ago. Okay, so what do we mean by spreading processes? So um, I think to begin with, you know, we might try to think about if, okay, if we've got coronavirus and we've got a bushfire, these are completely different things and it would be a bit ridiculous to say that we could understand them or model them in the same way. If we wanted to understand a virus, we'd study cell biology, immunology, um, various other areas of medicine, maybe the, the, the physics of what happens when somebody sneezes, that kind of thing. And if we wanted to understand a bushfire, we'd need to understand um, ecology, we need to understand the physics and chemistry of combustion and convection, uh, the earth atmosphere, weather dynamics, all of those things. And that's, that's very true. Uh, and there are certainly um, uh, obviously very important research that goes on at those levels. But actually, it turns out that at a very high level, the kinds of models that are used actually to make operational decisions for both epidemics and bushfires are actually very similar. And they're based around this kind of spreading process concept. So to take a simple example, I'll walk you through what's uh, referred to as the SIR model, susceptible, infected, and removed, or sometimes called recovered. And there's, there's a various different versions of this. There's refinements of this. There's variations of this. I think David showed the SEIR model, which is a, a, another version of this. But the basic idea is quite simple. You might have a network of nodes representing people or locations, and maybe there's some kind of infection that starts in node A. And over time, with some probability, this might spread to the neighboring nodes of A. And so, for example, it might spread from A to B. Now B becomes infected, and then there might be spread from B to D, and maybe from A to C with some probability. And over time, maybe A and B are removed from the network, hopefully because they're recovered, but possibly not. Either way, they're, they're removed from the network. And then now maybe D is spreading to E. And so you have these essentially three different states a node could be in. And then you could have kind of proportions of a population that are in these various states and so on. 
These sorts of models originated back in the 1920s, actually, to understand the spread of epidemics. Um, but they can actually also be used to understand the spread of bushfires. And as I was mentioning, I guess some of the operational models that are used in current practice for firefighting are of this nature. So in an epidemic, the network is really the social network. It's who is coming into contact with whom. And the cell states are these ones that are basically these disease states. So you're either susceptible, meaning um, you could be infected, you're, you're currently infected, or you're removed um, from, the, from the, 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 the process, hopefully because you've recovered. In a bushfire, the network structure is primarily geographic. So you might have cells representing individual geographic locations. And then uh, the spread can happen either at a very fine scale to do with the propagation of the firefront itself, or perhaps on a broader scale to more distant cells due to um, embers being carried by the wind. And the cell states here are actually directly analogous. So the susceptible state is unburnt um, bushland or forest or grassland or what have you. The infected state is currently burning and the removed or recovered state is uh, basically an area that's completely burnt out and can no longer burn anymore, basically because the fuel is extinguished. And of course, you could have proportional levels um, within these states as well. So that's kind of the, the high level analogy. And let's look at some of, I guess, the problems associated with this understanding and controlling this sort of process. So um, what we want to do is, uh, at one level, we might want to predict how the process is going to evolve. And so this is really about estimating those probabilities of spread from one node to its neighboring nodes. In epidemic modeling, this will be some function of the disease characteristics itself, how contagious is it, but also uh, the, the nature of the social network, who is meeting whom, how long do they spend together, and also things like hygiene practices, are people washing their hands? So this is, these are the factors that might go into those estimation of those spreading rates. Whereas in bushfires, we can have the same sort of probability of spread type model, but now it's going to be a function of things like um, the wind speed and direction in a particular location, the fuel load in an area, the moisture content in that, in that, in that, um, that fuel, and also the topography, so whether it's a sloping up or sloping down, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and in fact, there's been a lot of research in Australia at, at various universities and also at the CSIRO into constructing these sorts of models. They're based on a, a number of different underlying mechanisms, but in particular, the Aurora Australis model um, is, is based very closely on this kind of uh, cell to cell mapping um, process. Uh, there's been a lot of work in building these models and also validating these models. So this is work from the University of Western Australia, actually comparing the actual historical extent of various fires with what these models would predict. And actually, you can see there that there's uh, perhaps not um, perfect alignment, but significant enough alignment um, between the outlines and the shaded areas that you could use this uh, in, and, and it is used in, in operational circumstances for prediction. Okay, so modeling itself is quite challenging. You need to understand, people are trying right now to understand the, the, um, the nature of the COVID disease. Um, and in bushfires, there's a lot of remote sensing and there's a lot of potential for robotics here for building up information about fuel load, moisture content, that kind of thing. Beyond the modeling of spreading rate, there's also what we could call sensing of the current cell state. So this, the problem here is that we can't necessarily sense or test everywhere simultaneously. So we need to decide where to focus our efforts. And this might be on detecting new outbreaks. So in epidemics, this might be testing of high risk people, maybe people who've just arrived through an airport um, where you expect higher um, uh, likelihood. In bushfires, um, you're trying to monitor the landscape for spot fires. And we see here some figures, uh, images on the right. So recently in California, a US National Guard Reaper drone has been used for patrolling the area um, during their wildfires to, to locate spot fires. Um, so that's kind of locate new outbreak, outbreaks so that you can address them before they get out of control. A second type of monitoring you might want to do is where you know there is already an existing outbreak and you want to keep track of it. Basically, figure out how far 
is it spreading? And in epidemics, the, this is the problem of contact tracing. You know somebody's got it. Who have they spoken? Who have they been around? Who might they have infected? And in bushfires, this would be essentially tracking the fire perimeter. And there's been a lot of research over, over, the, over several years, actually, on use of UAVs for, for essentially tracing the perimeter, perimeter of, a, of, of a fire. OK, so supposing you can model the process and supposing you can sense the current state, what can you do about it? And this is, of course, response. Uh, so this is intervening in order to suppress the spread of this process. And this can take various forms. It could be preparatory before there is any outbreak, just how do you prepare the, the network itself? And so in epidemics, unfortunately, we don't have it yet for COVID, but this could be vaccination programs. In bushfires, this could prepar the preparatory actions are things like fuel load management, so fuel reduction burns and so on. And in the upper right, you can see actually a, a small drone that is being used for essentially starting small fires for the process of fuel reduction burns. So this is research that's going on at the moment. After something has begun, you've got these kind of reactive um, response. So in, and this is about stopping the spread or reducing the spreading rate. In epidemics, this would be things like travel bans, social distancing, um, various kinds of medical treatments. In bushfires, this might be things like cutting fire lines with a bulldozer or water bombing um, either on the fire or on kind of areas where the fire might spread to to suppress the spread. And what you want to be able to do is figure out, OK, where should I apply these resources? I've got limited resources. I can't suppress, I can't water bomb the entire landscape. I need to know where to, where to um, uh, where to uh, where to allocate this, and you might want to do this according to certain priorities. So in epidemics, you might want to protect uh, protect particularly high risk individuals. So for example, elderly or immunocompromised um, individuals. Um, in a bushfire, it might be populated or high economic value areas that you particularly need to protect protect uh, protect. So you're going to have these kind of cell dependent priorities. Um, so I think. Um, what I'll turn to now is just some of the recent research we've been doing on this problem. How do you, how do you allocate resources in order to protect um, important um, assets or important uh, nodes? I'll just kind of go through this fairly quickly because I'm mindful of time. But here we've got a very simple, um, I guess, simulated landscape. It's quite crudely drawn. You've got different types of um, different types of forest or desert areas, which would correspond to different spreading rates. And then there's a city in the middle, which represents, I guess, the asset you want to protect. And we can show here, hopefully you can see this a simulation of a fire starting in a particular location. And without any resources allocated, it spreads to the city and, uh, and that uh, causes a problem. We get burning in the city. So what we've been working on is suppose you have some kind of um, map of the likelihood of a particular fire breaking out. This might be, you might have higher likelihood areas corresponding to areas near roads, or it might be based on weather reports of lightning in particular areas and so on. So you might have, a, have a, an understanding of where the likelihood of an outbreak is. And then you can use this in order to plan the resource allocation. So here, what we've been able to do, and this takes just one second to compute on a laptop, it's a, uh, basically a major computational breakthrough. We've planned um, essentially building these fire line barriers around the city node. This is allocating 136 edges out of uh, three and a half thousand possibilities. If you think of all the possible ways you could do that allocation, it's 10 to the power of 248 possibilities, which is an astonishing number. If you had 2 billion computers running since the Big Bang, you would still only be able to check 10 to the 24 of these. So it's really, uh, it's completely impossible just to check all possibilities. But if you use this um, allocation, we run the simulation again, then you get the same kind of initial spread, but the city itself is protected. So this might look kind of fairly obvious, you protect the city, but it turns out the, the likelihood or the, the knowledge you have about the current state has a very big effect. So here we've got two similar allocations side by side or quite different allocations, but exactly the same scenario. In one case, you have very little knowledge of where the outbreak might start. So in that case, 
If you don't know where the outbreak might start, the optimal thing to do is to protect the city. On the other hand, in this, on the case on the right hand side, you know precisely the location of the current fire. And if you know precisely the fire location, the optimal thing to do is aggressively suppress that fire. And then there's also some resources allocated here, the kind of blue lines to um, suppressing on the path that the fire would likely take towards the city. And you can try all sorts of variations between these and so on, and it will work out the, the optimal allocation of suppressant resources. So that's just one example. This is in kind of the resource allocation problem. But I think broadly speaking, epidemics and bushfires, they both represent problems of suppressing some kind of damaging spreading process across a network. These tend to be huge scale networks, so we need methods that can scale and be distributed um, and work with limited data. And the associated kind of data computation um, problems include modeling, sensing, planning of interventions. I think there's two messages here. One is that robotic systems can play a role at many levels in terms of a robotic device, whether it's in the, the monitoring or the intervention, but also more broadly at kind of a holistic level, tools and concepts from robotic control, machine learning, and so on, can be applied for, um, for managing this whole process and understanding the network and understanding the, the control of it. And I think that goes more towards, I guess, David's point about the role of mathematical modeling in, in control of, of, uh, of epidemics. Okay, so that's, that's what I had to um, present. So I think I will maybe pass back to Elliot or Sue at this stage. Thanks, thanks, Ian. Elliot here. Um, one of the comments to be made about this is that the understanding that robots need information to make decisions, right? Uh, people in emergency responders have, you know, gut feelings, have intuition of many years of history. But the importance of data and in the decision making process about where you deploy robots and how they get used is critical in these scenarios. And of course, that information still can be used by the, hum the, the human emergency responders, but it's a lot more, we have to build, there's a lot more form formality in the robotics side of it. Um, Sue, so is there anything else you wanted to comment before we break into the, uh, the mirror? Thanks, Elliot. I think it would be great to just get people uh, unleashed. I think that we do have one question though um, that has uh, come through. And that is uh, one on, do, uh, does anyone work with the Australian Association for Unmanned Systems, AAUS? Yes, so one of our researchers, uh, Torsten Mertz, um, is a member of that and we do have, uh, we are associated with them, yes. Uh, does anyone, so that's from the CSRO Data 61 perspective, any of the other um, co-chairs? Ian. I think some of the colleagues in our um, UAV group are, are associated with that organisation, but I can I can get back to you on that. Excellent. I think it's true that we are not actually, um, uh, as part of the roadmap, I don't think we have any contributions and it would be great if there is anyone who would like to volunteer from that group um, to, to help give us that perspective. We are limited by our networks and uh, we want to make sure that it, the roadmap is representative. So if you 